Welcome back to Volumes. This will be the first episode of the new year, so I hope everyone's had a great new year. In this episode, I cover everything from veganism, LGBTQ plus community, uh, feminism and songwriting with Ella, whose social media is at Ella Kai Music um, on Instagram. You can check that out. The links will be in the bio. And yeah, uh, also in this episode, I tried to do something different with audio. I didn't really work out very well, but I hope you can put up with it and enjoy the episode. Thanks. Start off with talking about being trying to start there. Yeah, sure. Um, so like I'll add like a little introduction at the beginning, yeah. like once this is all done, but yeah, do you want to talk about how you became vegan and why mm-hmm. you became vegan? Yeah, um, I became vegan probably about three and a half years ago, um, sort of the way that probably I think quite a few vegans do, and I, yeah, I watched a few documentaries, I watched, I think it was um, Earthlings, I watched, which is very, very graphic, it's, yeah. um, yeah, it's essentially showing clips of like animals being slaughtered in slaughterhouses, um, and in the most horrific ways, you know. Um, and then I watched um, Forks Over Knives, which is more like yeah, yeah. health oriented. Mm-hmm. And then I watched um, oh, what's it called? The really famous one. Why is it going out of my head? <laughs> um, very famous, the most famous. Cowspiracy. Cowspiracy. That's, that's it. Exactly yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is more sort of environmental, so yeah. I sort of wanted to cover like yeah, crazy this, ground, this spectrum, I think. Yeah. And I think I was most driven by the ethical reasons in terms of like animal rights and stuff. Right. Um, just because, probably because the footage was just so, so graphic. So and prior to watching those, did you have any like previous influences out of that? No, not really. I think I, you know, I was watching sort of what I eat in a day and I, mm. I like videos and I was seeing that veganism was becoming bigger and I wanted yeah. to know why I think and just I'm a curious person and I wanted to sort of understand more about like where my food came from and right um, and just explore what else is out there yeah yeah, yeah. and I sort of I you know connect the dots that you know being vegetarian is good and that you're not eating you know the animals are killed so they can end up on your plate like yeah. I eat that much um but I didn't quite make the tie between like the dairy industry mm. and you know the meat industry and how it's all very, all very tied together yeah. um, in terms of malpractices and you know. I also feel like for yeah. a lot of people, even though they know, yeah, this is an animal, and then mm. I now eat that animal, it's hard to really create that connection of, oh no, that yeah. has to die, and then it has to go somewhere, and then there's a full process. Mm. It's not just like in a flash. It's now food. Oh yeah, you know for sure. I mean? Like it's crazy how we sort of this like dissociate from like what's on our plates and yeah. you know what we call a pet and what we you know yeah, what yeah. we eat and it's really strange. Yeah, I mean, yeah, domesticating certain animals and then certain animals being there for food is it's a really weird concept and it yeah. kind of makes you imagine like how that started. Mm-hmm. And, but yeah, that was sort of my journey. Um. So yeah, before we started filming. You mm-hmm. said, uh, I said that basically what I want to cover is like everything that's in your bio. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, if you want to like quickly like go over everything that's in your bio. Everything in my bio. Yeah. So what it's, is in my bio? Uh, <laughs> it's like queer, vegan, yeah. uh, feminist songwriter, yeah. right? Yeah. So <laughs> we covered right. veganism. Mm-hmm. So queer, wh- what's, uh, what's your <laughs> part of being queer? Um, like what do you mean like? I don't know, you put it in your bio. Okay, I right. Your bio. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I guess. I never used to like put it in my bio and I never used to sort of be quite as vocal as I right. probably am now. I think Why do you I, want to be more vocal now, do you think? Um I think when I was sort of, you know, discovering my sexual orientation, I didn't really not that I am a role model now, but I didn't have a lot of role <laughs> yeah. models and I right, didn't yeah. really have anybody around me like speak like being openly Queer, I think, but right. openly LGBTQ plus, um, and yeah, it was it was just something that as I became, you know, more accepting of my identity, and you know, for the longest time I identified as like bisexual, and that sort of felt semi um, right, and then I sort of landed on my identity as queer, which is more of a like umbrella term, and right. it just felt a bit more like politicized, I think, probably because you know you read like queer theory and stuff like that and mm-hmm. it feels more like something that uh the lgbtq 
uh, committees like delivery frames. Yeah. Um, and I really like that concept. And um, yeah, it's just something that I like felt I strongly identified with, perhaps not as much as I identify as female, <clears throat> but it was like one of those identities that I was like, this feels very me. Yeah. Um, and you know, I don't know what to put in bios. I'm like, okay, <laughs> these are my descriptors. <laughs> like, in queer, you know, it. I guess it's just yeah. great that sort of like sense of community, so people know when they can maybe like yeah, for sure. go to you for advice or what. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think being queer, like, it doesn't even necessarily just reflect like sexual like orientation. It, it covers like a lot of stuff. Yeah. Like, you know, stuff to do with like style and presentation and gender and you know that that word is used quite loosely. I think sometimes and um. Yeah, I think when I've seen it in other people's bios, I'd be like, oh, cool, like, they're probably, you know, like, an intersectional feminist, they probably, like, there are a lot of, like, connotations there. Right, yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. Um, am I right in saying that you have, like, a sort of, like, another platform specifically for queer, uh, like, uh, culture? Yeah, um, I haven't really used it in a while because it was, um, mainly this project I was doing in my module called, like, Queer and Gender. Right. Um, the module wasn't called that, like my project was the yeah. module. Um, and yeah, I just decided that I wanted to do like the sort of photography, um, Instagram. Right. Journal, so it's like I a guess. sort of, yeah, a visual journal. Of, yeah, I just of knew I. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. I just sort of knew that I was interested in like queer culture and sort of unraveling like gender and style and sexual orientation and right. sort of looking at how those things intersect or don't intersect. Um, and I, I'm just interested in people and just getting to interview people, I'm sure, as you know, it's like a yeah. really fun experience. It's, yeah, it's an awesome experience. It's yeah, so awesome. and I, you know, I've been quite fortunate with my, like, queer journey and, like, coming out and all that kind of stuff. I've been very fortunate, so it's been, like, very insightful for me to listen to people who haven't been quite so fortunate and mm, right. how their journeys differ or, you know, relate to mine, I think. It's yeah. been really, really insightful, yeah. I think for a lot of people, like looking at the outside, it's hard to realize like for every culture that exists, yeah. there's millions of subcultures oh, and millions sure. of ways of like interpreting those subcultures and being a part of them and interacting with them. And like, mm -hmm. no one realizes that if you're not on the inside. So yeah, yeah. I, I, it would be really interesting like for people to check that out and like see the people you spoke to and and how they all like became part of it and how they all interact with it their own way. Yeah, for sure. Mm. I think especially with Lancaster, like it's quite a small town and right. um, that's the University of Ontario in Lancaster. Um, yeah, and like so you sometimes feel like you don't really see the queer population or like, I don't know, sometimes I feel like I don't really see queer yeah. people unless I seek them out. So a lot of these people like I was already friends with because, you know, I'm actually drawn towards people who mm -hmm. like have similar experiences and mm -hmm. different opinions and that just happens to, you know, correlate. Um, but yeah, I got to meet people through like friends of friends, people who reached out to me. Um, so it sort of, it felt very warm and accepting, I think, in that sense. Because yeah. it was, you know, meeting more people from my community who I otherwise might not have met. Um, yeah. Um, so do you want to talk a bit about you? And like, so you were saying you went to, are you going to mm. uh, Lancaster yeah. University? Um, so when did you start going there? I started, oh, I think it was like, 2017 yeah about september october 2017 right so and i'm in the now yeah before you were there where did you live um so i had i basically moved to edinburgh about a year before i went to uni so i decided to take a gap year right uh, gap year <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what did you do during your gap year um i i sort of did the stereotypical thing i traveled um i worked um, it was quite a rough year for me, to be honest. I think a lot of it, you know, I, I experienced a lot of really bad bouts of like chronic depression and depressed mm. episodes, and that sort of debilitated me for a lot of that year. Um, Were you just like a bit lost in the way when you're heading like things in? Like, yeah. Or was it I, other stuff. I, don't know. <laughs> I think a lot of it was like a delayed reaction, to be honest, because I think during my school years, I was pretty miserable <laughs> um <laughs> to put it lightly and um i think the last few years especially like six four years were really quite difficult for me and you know i sort of dealt with that in that moment by working really hard and sort of putting off like any sort of processing of emotions right. really and just trying to get through it um 
and distract myself. And then I sort of felt like when that gap year happened, like it just sort of caught up with me. Right. Um, and it really didn't help. I was in a new city, like a yeah. new place, didn't really know anyone. Yeah. Um, when you're depressed, it's really difficult to meet people. Yeah. yeah. It was it was really challenging, but um, you know, valuable experience nonetheless. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I suppose it puts everyone in perspective, now you know what it's like, and you can always like help understand things from those experiences, maybe. Yeah, definitely. I don't know, I think, maybe that's complete nonsense what I just said. I no, I know that makes total sense. I think like this is why often people say that like you can't necessarily understand mental illness unless you've like gone through it because yeah. I think it does. You know, being at yeah, such yeah. a low point and like dealing with that isn't really something you comprehend, I think, unless you delve with it yourself. And I think often when I come out of it, I forget how bad it is to be in a depressive episode because mm. your mind almost sort of like blanks out of your memory. Like yeah. it's too painful to like remember how it feels. Yeah. So it's That's so interesting you say that. Yeah. yeah. So I literally I have like parts of that year that I don't remember because yeah. it's like my mind has just kind of been like, no, that's not a happy time, and yeah. it blocks out. <laughs> Which like might a, be good yeah. in a way, but yeah, yeah, totally. yeah, I suppose it's better maybe not remembering like that suffering. I was mm-hmm. just thinking it's kind of like that's probably a really bad analogy. If you like hurt yourself physically, mm-hmm. you you know that you didn't like it, but you mm-hmm. don't. You can never really replicate that pain in your head. You can't think, oh, that was this so or. I can compare it to this thing that happened. Yeah. You just know it was sore, but you don't. You can't feel the pain again. Yeah. And I suppose it's a bit like that. You just know everything was really bad. You can't really mm. think of like how bad it was or yeah. why it felt so bad. It's, it's so hard to sort of like rationalize it because it's uh, maybe it's just we don't understand it well enough yet. But mm. that's very interesting. You said it like that. Like we we do like block out these moments. Yeah. It's so fascinating. Um, so before you moved to Edinburgh, where were you? Mm. you I lived, was in Oxford. You lived in Oxford. So you yeah. spent most of your life in Oxford. Yeah, I grew up in Oxford. Yeah. Um, which was largely good. Like, I really yeah. can't complain too much. Like, I'm <laughs> you know, a mental illness, <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> um, I had a pretty pretty good childhood, and my parents, you know, I'm very lucky. They're very supportive in all my choices and everything that, you know, I've gone through. And I think especially things like mental illness, I think, you know, they don't really give parents a handbook for what to do yeah. like, when your kid is mentally <laughs> ill and so they did the best they could yeah. um yeah yeah it was interesting growing up there have you ever like received any like social backlash from saying that you're vegan or queer or, or speaking about uh, mental health um yes and no i think like i was saying to you earlier before the podcast i think like because of the you know the people i sort of like hang around mm. because I'm in this like sort of bubble almost yeah. like often my following and the people I follow are very like-minded but occasionally you know I do get comments like anyone really does and yeah. you know I've had comments like you know it's like you enjoy being depressed and things like <laughs> that which um I mean I'm quite lucky with like being queer like I don't think I've really had I've had sort of misconceptions I have had sort of like if I've been dating men I've had them sort of fetishise me also being interested in women or expecting a freedom. <laughs> um, stuff like that is just sort of infuriating. And do you think that's just naivety? Or what do you think that is? I think part of it is definitely naivety. I think part of it is probably porn culture. And then <laughs> yeah. just having watched loads of like, lesbian porn and being like, oh, like, that's, you know. Yeah. Which, again, lesbian porn is directed by made for men. Like, yeah. it's not, yeah. it's not really, you know representative of the queer community generally um and also they have like really long nails and i'm like if women had sex and they had really long nails it's gonna be really painful so um it's getting yeah. graphic <laughs> sorry yeah um <laughs> but uh yeah. 18 plus podcast oh god okay this is why i decided <laughs> to film for myself and i don't um so yeah, I think I'll get sort of questions like, you know, how do women have sex with each other and stuff like that, which right. supposedly it might come from my team. I'd rather someone ask questions and didn't, but it's sort of the assumption that you will yeah. then like have a threesome. Um, <laughs> or, yeah. um, so generally you've received more like positivity than negativity from people. Oh yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. I think like, especially stuff like music, like I've had people like message me being like, oh, like I related to that or you know, like yeah. I sing about something that's like quite deep, I think sometimes, and things that are, 
quite depressing. I don't think I'm a naturally sad person. I think I'm quite a happy person, but like my creative expression is to create music when I'm yeah. down or when something challenging has happened. Right. So like um, express yourself and maybe like get yeah. off your own shoulders kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. I think like, you know, I first started songwriting when I was like fourteen and right. you know, it was what, never what, really like influenced you to do it? Like what, what Um I'm not really sure. I think so my mum sort of signed me up to this thing called Rock School <laughs> when I was 14. Um, <laughs> not that I was... <laughs> it was... <laughs> no, Never really. Not. It was sort of like an after-school, like, club kind of thing. Right. <laughs> um, and, you know, a lot of people who went there were, like, very talented musicians yeah. and much better than me. Um, <laughs> but I, that was sort of my first, you know, songwriting kind of experience. Right. Had you played uh, music and stuff? Like, did you know any instruments and... Yeah, I played guitar for a few years prior to that, um, and I played so piano. You went going like completely naive. No, you no, had, no. Like, like I, I had basic, right. you know, <clears throat> like so understanding of sort like, of like a workshop for music or musicians. Yeah, it was sort of like helping you form like bands and stuff, right. and so I ended up being in this, you know, band. <laughs> what did you say you were like fourteen? Fourteen, yeah. 14? Fourteen, fifteen, yeah. Yeah. How was that experience? Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting. I don't remember much about it, to be honest, other than, you know, I was in a band. I started singing a band with my brother because my brother would also be forced to like, right. play that, which was interesting. <laughs> and he was playing the drum. He, he hated rock school. He did not like it. And there was this other guy who um, was nice, but it just didn't really, it just didn't work. <laughs> I mean, you know, being in a band, you kind of, you know when it's not working. And, yeah. And then I was put in a different band, uh, which was all guys, all really lovely guys. And then I stopped dating one of the drummers. Again, I was 14, what did I know? Um, <laughs> and, and then eventually that relationship and the band, at least my part of it, sort of drifted away somewhat. You broke up with um, I broke up, but no, I didn't. I mean, they were very much a band before I joined, so I didn't think <laughs> leaving really did anything. Um, but that was my like first experience, I yeah. think, with like, songwriting and like performing um yeah <laughs> that's awesome yeah <laughs> i don't know why like maybe i was like subconsciously wanted to believe it was like a really like sad moment happens and you want to do a write-up thing and you create this music but no it's like like post-school rock club <laughs> i mean yeah i think a lot of like i didn't songwrite <laughs> after that for a while because right. i didn't feel like i had anything to write about whenever i tried it didn't turn out very well and I think part of that was because you know I was probably fairly happy at that point and like I didn't have anything to write about and then you know the depression sort of hit and it was like oh okay there's I have a lot more material yeah. now um but yeah it was never really something that I was like oh I must perform this I must right. become like this I don't know, big pop star <laughs> <laughs> so you felt very like inspired in a sense to start writing music when you had these like low points yeah, I mean, it was my form of escapism, really, mm, and, like, right. sort of channeling, you know, I've never been the best person at processing emotions, I think, mm. and I think, mm. you know, Free Song, it's just really helped me, like, even one of my most recent songs, like, um, it was, like, inspired by, you know, me basically thinking about this person that I was dating, and I was like, why am I thinking, like, I was dreaming about them, and I was like, this is really frustrating, I thought I was over them, so I wrote a song about it no more dreams about them so oh. i was like great <laughs> so i think it really helps me like yeah like process stuff like get yeah. emotions out of me and like it's just really helping yeah. in that sense it's like you're storing those emotions somewhere else so you don't need to have them on you all the time yeah exactly it definitely yeah. feels like a weight is lifted off my chest because it would just it's like okay i've processed that i've sung about that um you know and then it becomes a song you've written in the past it becomes a past memory it doesn't yeah. become something that feels like it's burdening you almost it's really fascinating. Do yeah. you think that maybe you need something like a really low point to be creative? And do you think that like across mm -hmm. the board for most people, like that seems to be the case? Like we can look throughout history and point out, oh no, yeah. they were depressed or they had anxiety <laughs> or they were schizophrenic. And you could literally like, mm -hmm. there's no artist or creator or someone that's done something big and, and grand throughout time that doesn't have something there. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I've kind of been thinking about this myself because at the moment I'm doing like a dissertation that's about music and mental illness. Mm, and right. like, it's interesting writing songs for that and like 
not being depressed. <laughs> like, I still deal with depression, but I'm not, you know, a lot of my songs I wrote previously would be, like, in a depressive episode, I'd be writing right. it. Um, so it's interesting. I don't think it's... I think there's, you know, credit in doing both, like, writing when you're in a dark place and when you're not, because I think when you're not, you have a lot more perspective and you can mm. reflect on it in a way that's perhaps more healthy and right. more rational. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I, I sort of see like pop music now and a lot of it isn't necessarily, it, it doesn't seem like it's from artists, <laughs> like personal experiences. And yeah. it doesn't, you know, there, there's not much really, um, especially in pop music, about, like, mental illness. Mm-hmm. Like, I've been trying to find mm-hmm. songs to analyse and things for my dissertation, and it's just been... Yeah. It's been weirdly difficult. I'm like, how is this... Because mental illness <laughs> is something that affects all of us. Or mm-hmm. oh, mental health affects all of us. Um, so, yeah, it was really strange to me. But, yeah, but every pop song's, like, <laughs> makes no sense. It's like they describe everyone the most vaguest way, mm. in the most vague of ways. So yeah. they all feel like, oh, they're talking about me, that's me, or da, da, da. oh, I feel so, so personal, but yeah. everything's so, <laughs> so bad. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I was doing this, um, like, focus group for my dissertation, and one of them was talking about the song Sweet by the Psycho, and yeah. it, I just didn't even, like, I'd heard that song so many times, and I'm just like, wow, there's so many, like, problematic images of, like, this sort of, like, manic pixie dream girl, and, like, mm. you know, uh, like, she's sweet, she's cool, but she's crazy, right? Yeah. You know? And I think you also get that a lot with, like, you know, um, if a girl, like, dumps a guy, like, especially in, like, movies, it's like, oh, dude, like, she looks crazy, like, whatever. And, like, I feel like that's often used as, like, a sort of, in a very offhand way. Yeah. And it's, like, yeah, it's, it's really strange to me. But. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I actually think that's just because, like, men don't want to be the yeah. problem in the situation yeah i think i think often it's easier to say that a woman is crazy than to say like oh actually maybe i was the problem yeah. or maybe there was a problem with like the relationship i think yeah um i also, i think terms like crazy are just like you know i i often use it but then i think my excuse is often that like um you know, I deal with mental illness, so I can reclaim that word, which is, uh, I, I don't know, probably problematic. Um, but I, I don't know. I think a lot of words like that are tossed around, and yeah. you know, I have friends. Crazy has no meaning anymore. It has so no weird. meaning, and I'd have people be like, you know, I never know if they're joking or not, being sort of like, oh, like I'm so stressed, I feel like I'm having a panic attack. Ooh. And so yeah. either I would be like, you know, normally I would be like, are you okay? Like, is there anything I can do? And then they'd just be like. Oh, like I'm not having a panic attack, yeah. but like almost if you don't take it literally, yeah. you know that might be their way of trying to like open up to you about yeah. their anxiety, or whatever. So it's... I take everything so literally, like it, yeah. it's almost dangerous how literal it is. Yeah. Like if someone says that's crazy, I'd be like, yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. 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 okay. You we'll walk in, and be like, oh, that toast is crazy. Like mid toast so fast, I'd be like, why is it toast so crazy? Like, yeah. <laughs> Just dissecting. Yeah. It. Yeah. <laughs> I'm breaking it down like. What does it mean? And, mm. But yeah, if someone said, oh, I think I'm taking a panic attack, I'd be like, right, okay, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> I, no, I've had people like, say that. And, and you know, I I mean, I ended up with, I probably only had one or two panic attacks. Panic attacks and anxiety attacks are quite different. So, mm. um, but yeah, like I've dealt with anxiety oh, wait, what's, attacks. What's the difference? Yeah. Excuse my naive mistake. No, no, <laughs> not at all. I mean, I only realised that they were two different things, like probably not very long ago. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to explain this in the best way, but um. But I believe it to be is like panic attacks um, often have like more, they're often more extreme and they often, you can literally feel like you're dying. Like, so when I first had a panic attack, I was like, I'm having a heart attack. I'm yeah, no. like, okay. I'm dying. <laughs> um, and it was really horrible. Whereas anxiety attacks, for me at least, I have some of the symptoms of panic attacks. So, you know, shortness of breath, like not right. feeling like I can breathe. Um, sort of like a heavy feeling in my chest, like um, heart beating fast, like sort of being shivery and then being really, really warm, like mm. almost feeling like I'm having a temperature. Um, so I sort of have stuff like that would, that would be like simmering. Um, often I just call them like mini anxiety attacks because it will, those are often for me the worst ones because they last, they can last like hours for me. Oh. <laughs> they can just, the symptoms will sort of simmer there and either they will build and actually sometimes it's better because then they're over and done with or they'll keep on sort of simmering. Um, so at least in my experience, you know, having had like, I 
think only like one or two panic attacks and then anxiety I'm attacks. Sweating. I'm thinking about that, I'm like anxious, thinking, oh, yeah. I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. It's um it's not the nicest no. experiences, but I think everyone deals with anxiety on different levels. So Is there any like direct correlation towards like what makes you happy? Or is it just Um Yeah, I mean I think it really can depend. So like the first time I had a panic attack, it was, you know, I could sort of reflecting on it. I was like, you know, it was because essentially, I don't remember too much detail, but it was essentially because I was really worried about a friend and right. about like them doing irreparable damage to themselves right. and like, and me being like, I should talk about this. I don't want to betray her trust though. Like, mm. and like that just sort of like yeah. bubbled in me. And that was like my first panic attack I mean it was no fault of her own because I would have had it in any sense anyway like something would have triggered it because that was just the time in my life where things were difficult um so it's just a lot of things just constantly building and building I think so yeah yeah. I think that often with my anxiety attacks it can actually be like you know occasionally if there's like like I'm the kind of person that gets anxious with like surprises or like loud noises like things like balloons (laughs) terrify me Mm -hmm. which is like a really weird fear um, but even little things like that can set me off sometimes. So, you know, my worst, basically, the worst thing would be like a surprise birthday party. Yeah. <laughs> so like, like that, all that. attention <laughs> on me, balloons, and a loud surprise. <laughs> like, I don't know how people can like surprise parties, but anyway. No, <laughs> they're not fun. Um, so sometimes it can just be a little thing. I yeah. think it really depends. Sometimes I can trace why it's happened, and sometimes I'm literally just like, no, it just mm-hmm. you know but again sometimes it's you know if you don't process emotions then it sort of builds up in the back of your mind yeah, yeah. and you don't even really realize it and then it gathers momentum and then it sort of yeah that's an interesting thought as well do you think it's like uh, beneficial to talk about these things and express the way you feel and and constantly talk about uh like mental health and, and things along those lines do you think it it's helpful not just for people hearing it and feeling connected to it but for yourself to talk about it Mm. yeah I mean I think it's necessary I think you know I think it's difficult because you know I want to say that everyone should have counselling but I know that I've not always had the best experiences with counselling and not pretty much everyone I know who's been through like NHS counselling has not had the best experiences (laughs) Um, and like, I'm very fortunate to be able to afford like private counselling, which right. has like helped me. Um, have you have you ever tried uh, like NHS counselling? I have, yeah. So, so I went can, through it. You can tell that because like you've got the perspective on both. Yeah, yeah. So I went through NHS counselling when I was like, I don't know, maybe fifteen or sixteen, I think. Um, but it was again, it was it didn't feel hugely like my choice. I think I think that didn't help. I think often you've got to, I mean, this is very general, this is just, you know, in my experience, but you've got to, like, want to get help, I think, and I just wasn't at that stage, I was still at the sort of, like, denial and, you know, trying to accept what was going on right. phase, and I think often with NHS counselling, I don't think it's necessarily for their own, I think it's very underfunded, and I think mm. a lot of the structures put in place there, you know, for no fault of the staff, it's just, like, what they've been told to do, yeah. but it feels very checklisty. it kind of feels like, okay, you're going to you know, come here like every so often, we're gonna do a like mood chart and you're gonna tell me how you feel on this mood chart. And then next week you can do another mood chart if you've done your like mood homework and like tracked your emotions or whatever and then see how you feel. Possibly that worked for some people, but for mm. me it was incredibly stressful. I still, I, I was, cause I couldn't really talk about, I wasn't talking about anything really. I was, you know, um, very much in denial, very much in my own head and you know, I think I just like faked a lot of the mood stuff because I didn't mm-hmm. want to. I didn't want to go. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, yeah. And then at one point they, like, they sort of breached my confidentiality. Basically, they. <laughs> how do I put this? <laughs> so you, essentially, if they think that you're at risk to yourself, then they are allowed to like contact your parents to put you there. Um, but they're like meant to, you know, let you know beforehand. Okay. Um, I wasn't actually at risk to myself, but they basically sent a letter through to my parents about something that we talked about briefly in counselling. Um, I hadn't expanded on, they hadn't told me anything. Um, yeah, and I was at home and I just saw this letter and I was like, that's weird. And I don't know, something within me was like, you need to read this. And so I opened mm. it up and I was like, 
Ooh, this is a lot of confidential information right. that I just about start to talk about in therapy. Right. Have not talked about my parents. Um, and that was like that was terrifying. And that just I you know. Yeah. And and I didn't I literally didn't go back to therapy until about a year and a half ago because of that, because it, yeah. it was very traumatic. Yeah. Um yeah. Did I your just, parents ever find out they'd be sitting like that? Or did you just put that down there? I don't know if I've ever mentioned <laughs> it to them, you know. They'll probably hear on this podcast and be like, what was that? <laughs> um no, I think I mean they knew that I was unhappy with it because I already expressed to them that it wasn't really working yeah. for me. Um I even tried before that I actually had private counseling because you know you're on the waiting list for like six, eight months. Yeah. Like, it's a long time. Um but again she was it was very like CBT, which I know works for some people, but it was essentially giving me anxiety attacks, <laughs> like yeah. going for like doing these exercises gave me anxiety yeah. attacks because it was like very focused on like breathing. And for me, I needed distraction. Yeah. Um, and that's what helps me calm down, not focusing on the physical symptoms I'm having. So, yeah, so very like one mm -hmm. one route that they can take. And yeah. if you like differ from that route, it's your problem, not right. not their problem kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. They don't they don't try and apply to every individual. Yeah, 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 exactly. And I don't want to sort of totally write off CBT because I know it does work for some people, yeah. but I think often they do, do, do like give these statistics. Like, you know, when I was at the NHS, they were like, oh, you know, like 85% uh, of the people that leave here are like dead, you know, mm. like, like making out like they were cured from mm. this. Like, and, and I'm like, no, they've just probably done what I've done, faked your mood charts and like, yeah. <laughs> made it seem like they were fine. And then just be like, you know. Also, 85% doesn't even seem that impressive. Like, no. like a, a hundred percent is what we should have, a hundred percent of success. Like, if mm -hmm. you heard that only like 85% of people survived, like, going to the doctors, yeah. I'd be like, mm, I don't know if I'm going to the doctors, so I'm just leave it. Yeah. I think it's difficult though, like mental illness, it's like, it's, everyone has such unique experiences, yeah, it's the yeah. same with like medication, it's yeah. like, it's really difficult to find something that is going to work for everyone, yeah. and I think, yeah. Maybe that's why it's so good to talk about these things so people can like yeah. explore all these different ways of thinking and yeah, kind of doing. Sure. Yeah, sure. I mean, does help them. yeah. I mean, for me, like, I needed therapy and meds yeah. and like self initiative, I think. And right. But like, I don't think not necessarily everyone needs that. And also, you know, I had years where I wasn't on meds that when I very much wanted to be on meds, but like, you know, and they're called my parents, but they sort of weren't that keen really for me to try that route which is fair because you know my brain is still developing and all that kind of stuff mm. um but also like, like this help yeah what's like does it help yeah 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 it really helps like it's it's not really a oh this fixes everything no. it sort of it like neutralizes you a little bit yeah. um which is difficult because you don't experience extreme good, highs yeah. you know, or extreme lows but it, it it means you don't really have periods of like intense happiness that mm. you perhaps might have um, but I think at that point I was just so low that I was like, don't feel any happiness anyway. Like, let's just like, <laughs> let's just even it out. Um, and it really helps because I think once your mood is neutralized, it's it's much easier to have that, find that initiative. Whereas yeah. before it was just like physically and mentally impossible to get out of bed. Like it just, it just wasn't happening. That's yeah. scary. Yeah. That's scary thoughts. It is. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but better now? Yeah, yeah, all cures. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> but, but, uh, no, no, I'm I'm doing so much better. Yeah, I think a lot of the stuff that I'm doing now and like talking a lot more about it, I think yeah. I never would have imagined me like getting through it. Um, and yeah. I suppose yeah. it's hard to see that the grass could be greener on the other side when you're there and oh, you can't sure. see any grass and you're panicking and everything's going oh, on. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think even like my first year at uni, like it was. I was still trying to like find the right dose of meds and it was like it was difficult in that sense because I was it was a lot of newness I was trying to make friends I was in this like new place and I was still going through very like debilitating depressive episodes but being around lots of people yeah. all the time which it felt quite crushing uh, I wasn't there for obviously um but it's it's just a lot I think sometimes when you're in that episode you just I don't want anyone to see me I don't want anyone right. like to see me in that state, I just wanted people to see me when I was like happy and you know. For people that maybe currently are going through what you went through, mm. going to like university, being all, like around lots of people, yeah, and experiencing what you experienced, what would you suggest to them or what would you recommend? 
Um, I think if you're not getting therapy, then try it. <laughs> if you, like, I don't know, I think go through, if your university has, like, well-being services, I think definitely try those out. Um, you know, I did that, and it was it was helpful. It was still a bit NHS-like. It was still a little bit clinical for me. Um, but you do get sort of free sessions. Um, but you only get sort of, like, four or five of them, and then they assess you right. whether you need more. But still, get all the help you can get from yeah. university. They're there to, you know, you're paying them. Like they, they need to, yeah. they need to support you. Um, and if you can afford it, then maybe try private therapy and just realize that like not every therapist is going to be for you. Not yeah. every approach is going to be for you. Yeah. Um, and not to yeah. give up in that sense. Um, and definitely like speak to your doctor. Like go with a friend. Like I would get like anxiety attacks going to a doctor. Um, but like going with a friend or going with a parent. Um, it's very helpful um, yeah just try and get a dialogue going I think, I think yeah. the more you talk about it um, the less you feel like it's an isolated experience which is mm. something that mental health certainly feels like yeah, mental health feels like. yeah. I think for uh, it seems to be so it's definitely less taboo now than ever mm. but it seems to be still so taboo to even like talk about it or admit to yourself that it exists yeah and for all we know that it could be the person right next to us it could be like having the same problem or like that kind of thing so mm. the, maybe like talking about it you might realize oh wait everyone's like this yeah and we're all fine or you realize oh no wait we're always going downhill yeah really <laughs> um, yeah and yeah. um, so going back to your music mm -hmm. so what's happening with your music right now you're just making some music putting it out there and what's the plan Oh, what's the plan? Good question. What is the plan? Um, I, I, think, swear. <laughs> I mean, so when I'm back in Edinburgh, like I have a mate who does like um, sort of gigs at different, um, he sets up like sort of open mics at different bars mm. across Edinburgh, which is really cool. And so whenever I'm in, in Edinburgh, I'm sort of like, hey, can you do <laughs> please? <laughs> um, which, is, which is nice, and he's always great at doing that. Um, Does he have any like social media to like? like uses to promote the gigs and stuff yeah so if you're like a local musician like it's called pressure valve and right. his name is bill um and he's yeah he's <laughs> he's great at all that stuff um and he's really great at, like getting a crowd excited yeah. about you okay. um which is really great oh, but perhaps too much so i'm like please lower that expectation <laughs> a little bit um i'm still an actor here um, but no he's a lovely guy though. um no yeah, one's ever been on stage and like, right, guys, calm down. Yeah. Oh, right, yes. <laughs> well, you, I mean, I think especially when you're performing in pubs, you don't, you don't want them to expect this sort of Beyonce-like performance. <laughs> um, you know? Um, yeah, so that's been really great. So I do that when I'm in Edinburgh. I'll sort of do, like, open mics when I'm in Lancaster too. I did this thing last year called Battle of the Bands, mm, um, which yeah. I got to the finals in, which was really cool. And I'm going to do that again this year. Um, and if you win it, then you get, like, Three hundred pounds mm -hmm. recording yeah. um, studio time, which I really desperately want. Yeah. <laughs> I have a lot of music that I've written, and not all of it that's recorded. And so I think my goal mainly is just to get it recorded yeah. and get it out there. And you know, whoever listens to it, great. If someone doesn't want to, that's fine. Like I, I think it's just having that there because um, at the moment it's just sort of in like voice notes on my phone. And, right. Yeah. Um, you know, I've performed it, but I haven't recorded it in a sort of studio yeah. sense or in a you know, yeah. uh, having it's not been and mastered and mixed and ready to actually be yeah. put somewhere. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah. Is that something you want to go down to? Is it music you'd like to primarily pursue it, or is it more just a hobby for you? I, I honestly don't know. I'm at this weird sort of crossroads in my life, which I find stressful, but it should be exciting, really. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I don't really, I don't really quite know. Um, it's something I really love doing. I yeah. think for me, the worry is if it becomes a job, then it feels like. Oh yeah. It feels yeah. stressful and like feeling like I have to, you know, make music really and anything. have a deadline to make mm. music is kind of strange. Um, but I mean, ideally, I'd love to release like um, like an album or an EP mm -hmm. or something. Um, you know, I think I, I don't want to get my expectations up. And I think as well, my music, like, I think because I have such low like, self esteem, like, I didn't know that I was, it was something that I was actually okay at and could do for a while until well, I actually yeah. performed it and I got well, like yeah. that so like <laughs> well it wasn't tell you I think I got validation from others that this this was something I was alright at um that I was like oh okay this is maybe mm. something I could do a bit more 
Um, and even now I'm like, is this okay? Like, I don't know. Um, but yeah, something I'm working on. Not bad. What else is going on in your life and where else are you kind of heading? Other than music, just in, in life, what's the goals? Um, the I mean, we've just started a new year, <laughs> so do you have any new year resolutions? Um, I don't because I used to set all these resolutions and it just, it felt like things that I needed to do. And, mm. You know, I'm quite happy in myself. I think just continue to work on myself and continue to, you know, focus on recovery and mental health isn't, you know, isn't something that's linear and easy. Mm. Um, so I think just making sure that if I'm choosing to do something, I'm doing it for me. I think I have this fear that I'm not going to be relevant or exciting mm. or interesting. Mm. And I think often because of that fear, I sign to a lot of stuff and I take on too much for me. Um, and yeah, I just, I don't want to be, I don't want to be quiet and irrelevant because I think I felt like that for a lot of my right. childhood. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, so that's almost an hour we've been filming. So do you want to like um, plug your stuff? And I'll yeah, get your sure. Way. Um, so my Instagram, SoundCloud, and Facebook page is Ella Karen Music. That's like all lowercase. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. That. <laughs> so yeah, listen, listen to the music. Uh, follow, enjoy, like, comment, all nice stuff. Yeah, thank you very much for coming. Yeah,